All right, welcome everyone to this session today um, by Learn WordPress. Uh, this session is called Designers and Developers, Cats and Dogs Living in Harmony uh, with our guest presenter, Kirsten Starcher. Um, quick introduction, my name is Courtney. Um, I am located in, oh, there we go. I am located in Oahu, Hawaii. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm representing the uh, WordPress training team via learn.wordpress.org. And uh, Kirsten Starcher has joined us as the presenter today um, uh, at outsideinthesun.com. Um, she is a developer, a designer, a, <laughs> a little bit of a little bit of everything um, coming from the Vancouver, Canada area. <laughs> See a comment in the chat. Cats and dogs aren't the problem. <laughs> it's the owners who can't get along. <laughs> I just, just went and started giggling at that too. <laughs> right. And yeah, um, I will let Kirsten take it from here. Um, I am also letting a few more folks in uh, to the to the room. Um, but I will stop my share so Kirsten can share her screen. All right. So thanks for joining us today, Kirsten. Oh, thanks very much. Let's see, let's make sure we got the right screen here. That looks like the one. Okay. Uh, so yeah, welcome everybody. Um, nice to meet all of you. One of you I know I already know. Um, so today I am gonna be talking a bit about how designers and developers can work uh, better together, like cats and dogs living in harmony. Uh, a little bit about myself first. I grew up in Newfoundland, Canada. I got my undergrad and master's in computer science in the mid 90s. I have been working on the web since there was a web. I've worked in pretty much all aspects of it. Um, I mean, initially there wasn't such a thing as a new media degree and uh, uh, there wasn't any kind of all encompassing package where you could learn all the different things you had to kind of figure it out on your own. So I've done design, I've done development, I've done content creations, and I've often been in that sort of weird little space between design and development. I worked in New York for a few years doing sites for things like Bravo and the Independent Film Channel, other corporate promotions and sites. I came back to Canada and freelanced full time for nearly 20 years. These days, I mainly focus on WordPress front-end development. I'm the uh, senior developer at F Squared Marketing, where we build custom sites for law firms and the legal industry. I am a dog person, but right now I only have fish tanks. So what we're going to talk about today, a little bit on just acknowledging that people have different communication styles, on appreciating the other's perspective and needs, um, some tools and some things to keep in mind to help project communication go more smoothly and uh, things to keep in mind. So I'm going to make a bunch of sweeping generalizations here about designers and developers because, you know, there's a few things that tend to be common to us, but uh, uh, not everybody. Um, I'm thinking about mainly small teams and agencies or freelancers where you have, in situations where you have one person dedicated to design and one person dedicated to development. So um, in the chat earlier, we were asking kind of what everybody's roles are. Are you more of a designer or developer? And um, I have, uh, Need to get back to the chat so I can see more what the answers were. I got the gist that it was a little bit of this and a little bit of that. <laughs> that uh, there are some exclusive designers, some exclusive developers, and some who do a bit of a mix of everything. So that's, that's kind of what I would expect. Um, is, but yeah, I'm going to be looking mainly at sort of the cases where you have somebody who's dedicated to that one track and is mainly trained in that and mainly focused on that. So designers and developers typically do what we do because it suits our abilities and our personal way of thinking, which is great because it makes it possible for us to bring our best specialized selves to a project. 
but it means we see the same thing in totally different ways, and it affects how we communicate about a project. So designers and developers may or may not be a great match in a particular project, but sometimes we're just thrown into a situation to together. Uh, you could think of it a little bit like college roommates, where you know sometimes you get one very rigid person put together with one very casual laid back person, and they don't necessarily agree about who's tidying what and who organizes that, but they have to find a way to make it work and communicate despite those differences. Communication conflicts aren't uniquely between humans. A tail wagging means a very, very different thing to a dog than it does to a cat. And to a dog, a going belly up is usually a show of trust or surrender. To a cat, it means they will now use as many of their sharp parts as possible. It's possible for us to barge through life unaware of the underlying messages that we're sending and receiving, assuming that we're being clearly understood or that we understand the other person. In order to successfully collaborate on a website, we have to address both the technical needs of the project and the human needs of the collaborators. We're gonna focus here on the human needs first. We all want to feel that our expertise and our knowledge is respected, that our time and our effort is appreciated, that any decisions made about this project will take us into consideration, and that we're trusted. I've often heard designers complain about handing their work over to a developer and having the final result totally miss the point. Maybe it deviated too much from the design or it just wasn't functional. And sometimes the developer has even abandoned the project or just stonewalled and stopped responding to their requests. The choices the designer makes in a web design have been made for a particular reason based on that designer's knowledge of user experience and aesthetics. Designers ideally want the finished product to look just like what they designed and for the site to function intuitively. Micromanaging often happens when the designer doesn't trust the developer to carry out their vision. I've often heard developers complain about a designer fixating on small nitpicky details, changing their mind halfway through, complaining that something doesn't work when it wasn't finished yet, or giving designs that can't actually be implemented. Developers need clear information up front to make the process smooth without having to backtrack and redo their work. They need to be given space to work. The further along you are in the development process, the more difficult the changes can be. Once you've poured the concrete, it can be very difficult to change the ceiling height. Avoidance happens when the developer doesn't trust the designer to appreciate their work. Everyone wants good communication. It might not always seem like that, but we're all looking for it in our own way. And nobody wants to be put into an uncomfortable situation that they don't know how to get out of. So first off, align your ducks. Set the expectations up front. Establish all the project's needs up front. Get all the boring, dry details nailed down as clearly as possible right at the beginning and keep those details available for handy reference. Document everything. If you're not in charge of the project plan, and this isn't your job, at least make sure you've gotten clarity for what you need and what is expected of you. Um, if you're on the contract side of things, you're going to want to put all of that in the contract that that you and the client are aware of, of course, but then you're also going to want to have some form of business requirements that you can share with the designer or the developer on your team and have something very clearly knowing what you are building and, and what you're not. Um, get any of the little details here. I've got a few notes on the slide about things like who supports the site after the launch, who trains the client, who is, filling in content from the old site or from the client submissions. Um, just make sure all of this is understood upfront because the more that you have upfront, 
uh, and you have something that you have a history and you can refer to it, the less confusion there is going to be later on. So be realistic. Be realistic about timelines. Don't make promises that you can't deliver. If you see a problem, point it out. Um, the other person may not be aware that uh, something isn't manageable, or they may already have thought of something and know a solution, and then they can put your mind at ease. At least one of you is uh, going to learn something. Sometimes, maybe in the middle of a project, hard conversations need to be had. I've had clients whose previous designer or developer bailed without any explanation, leaving the client lost and confused. If you're midway through a project when you realize you're in too deep or there's something that you don't understand, speak up. The sooner that you raise an issue, the sooner it can be resolved or accommodated. There's nothing worse than at the end when project is supposed to be done, uh, scrambling to find out you know, that something isn't going to be possible and you are going to miss a deadline. We all want to be trusted for our work, but the trust only comes in time as you show that you are capable of delivering on your promises and doing your best to ensure that things go smoothly. So be honest about your knowledge and your expertise. If something is new to you, admit you're willing to learn, but you're not sure how long this might take. Allowing yourself to be vulnerable helps the other person trust you since they can see you're not just gonna bluff your way through the project and that you'll be able to speak up if there's a problem. Often when people aren't honest, it's out of fear. Maybe being judged, getting something wrong, looking stupid, losing the job. You don't have to admit these fears to your colleagues, but at least be able to admit them to yourself and ask yourself if this is getting in the way of your relationship with your coworkers or your bosses. So, what do we need to know up front and whose perspective are we looking out from? All right, now we have advice for the designers. So involve the developer early because they can confirm that what you've designed is viable. Um, it is really unpleasant to promise the client something and then have it turn out to be a logistical nightmare to build. And then you have to go back to them and explain why you had to change what they'd already approved and expected. Also, the developer might be able to suggest some approaches and features and improvements that you wouldn't have thought of. The, sometimes the more eyes you have on uh, something, the better. There is a limit to that, uh, but definitely having the developer involved early is, uh, is pretty crucial. Ask your developer for what format they need your design to be in and stick to it. I have asked for slideshow images to be sent to me as 72 DPI JPEGs and had someone send me a nine megabyte EPS file that wouldn't even open. Um, that slows things down, uh, requires a lot of back and forth, is totally unnecessary. If you're using Photoshop, clean, and you're giving the Photoshop files, clean up any unused PSD layers, give the design as a flat PDF or JPEG, as well as the source files. So as the designer, it's not your job to know everything, but it is good to have sort of a sense of the broad strokes, especially if you're coming from a print background. Um, it'll help you make better decisions in your designs. Just knowing a little bit about what is possible with CSS or knowing about whether, where the best breakpoints are for a responsive design. Uh, know your way around WordPress to some extent. Uh, you don't have to be an expert, but know how to do some things around posts and pages and change some settings. Um, Find examples of things that you'd like to see. So you know, maybe you have a particular type of slider or menu functionality that you'd like implemented. If you can show somewhere that it's being used on another site and show, like, I really like how they've done this. Maybe, you know, maybe a little less of that and a little more of this. If you even find a code pen with an example and the developer can use that as a reference, that is fantastic. It really helps us to visualize what it is that you want the end result to behave like. 
remember that the, the developer's job is not the same as your job, and they're looking at your design with different eyes than you are. I'm speaking as a developer, which I mainly am these days. Uh, I don't always see, I don't always notice if two font sizes are exactly identical or not. Um, so you want to make it as easy as possible for the developers to get the details that they need so that we don't miss anything. You can do this either by designing in a tool like Adobe XD or Figma, or by making your own cheat sheet. Um, do also keep in mind that the web is a relatively fluid medium, and there's going to be some changes that have to make, be made for different screen sizes and devices. So be willing to accept a little bit of flux uh, as long as it overall looks like your design. Um, I would like to do a quick chat poll here and find out how many people are using uh, Adobe XD or Figma for design and how many are using Photoshop or something else. There's the chat here. I'll move her. Okay, we got a couple of figmas. Ooh, paper and pencil. I love it. Some days I swear I'm just going to go back to paper and pencil entirely. <laughs> just took away with the whole computer side of it. Okay, okay. Okay, interesting question uh, or answer um, from Elisa. Um, I've started designing in the browser now that there's blocks. Mm. A good point. Yep. All right. Okay. So we've got uh, an even mix of Figma and other stuff by the looks of it. All right. Let me just put you guys up over here. So uh, Interesting, there wasn't, I don't think there was one person using XD. At least nobody is saying so. Um, but here is an example using Adobe XD. And one of the things that I really like about this or Figma is that you can see the CSS details of any element when you click on it. Um, you can also prototype sites more fully than you can in Photoshop. You can set menu behaviors and hover states and things like that. So you can see here I've, whoops, nope, go back. Um, here I've got uh, a header selected and over on the right, um, it's giving me a bunch of CSS settings. So rather than in Photoshop where you kind of have to go in and then in, go through a whole bunch of different um, uh, panels. Uh, here it's just oomph, all on one screen in one place. Um, it's it's pretty sweet. I was kind of excited when we all started to migrate more towards this. And uh, here's a similar example in Figma. Oh, uh, Linda XD is an Adobe product that is kind of like Figma. So it uh, it lets you it, it lets you mock up a site, um, you know, create each of the pages sort of in one gigantic file, um, create walkthroughs for the client. Um, yeah, well, apparently <laughs> apparently Figma is better because <laughs> so so maybe don't worry about XD. Uh, it seems like uh, at least in this group. Uh, uh, Figma is winning. So this is what Figma looks like. And honestly, even just looking at it, it kind of is tidier. Like the CSS on the right is, um, to me, just kind of easier, easier to deal with. Uh, so yeah, here's an example from a site where the designer has set up uh, kind of examples of buttons and page titles and font styles and so on. So I can just go through this, click on anything that I want, and it's going to give me the uh, CSS details for it, which is really nice. They uh, The de designers can also set it up so that you can see what kind of menu behavior they want or what kind of hover states and uh, um, it makes it easier for me to then do some of the animated or JavaScript components of things to uh, uh, to be more like what they're envisioning. 
So if you're not using XD or Figma, you can still create uh, nice, clear, comprehensive design documents manually. So here's an example uh, for a project uh, I did many years ago where the designer gave me a nice little cheat sheet with all the textiles that I was going to need, as well as all the colors and RGB codes that, uh, hex codes rather, that I was going to need. Um, here's another example where they gave me a font style guide kind of down below, and then a section of the design where it refers to those fonts and uh, where it also is clearly marked out the distances between the items. Um, so basically ensuring that I wasn't going to miss it going around measuring in Photoshop myself. Uh, you might be groaning about doing this sort of extra work as a designer. Um, I'm not saying that you have to do this, but it will help the developer give you what you want. If it's clearly marked in front, um, then it's clear that that is important to you in your design, that you, you want these gaps and to be accurate, and uh, means things are less likely to be missed. Oh yeah, Doug, you're right. Adobe did buy Figma. And I guess we have yet to see what that's going to mean. So for designers, a little bit about the care and feeding of your developer. So let a developer focus while they work. Don't look at the work in progress if you can't resist sending fixes. Wait until they are ready for you to look at it. Be like a good waiter at a restaurant. You're there if you're needed, but you're not constantly imposing yourself. It can be overwhelming to have to sort through a huge laundry list of changes. Um, sort your changes and tweaks by, by priority. Be willing to be a little bit flexible. You may not know whether that, oh, that little, little adjustment that you want to make is going to take you 15 seconds or a few hours, but don't assume that it's easy because it's easy for you to do in Figma. Rebuilding something that is already done can be hard and soul-sucking work. Now, developers, you have some decisions to make on how to implement the design. It's going to be up to you to determine what's appropriate for the site. Uh, the decision is going to affect how you and the designer work together and keep things on time and budget. So know when to use a pre-built theme that you bought off of theme forest, whether when you're built, using a child theme or not, whether you're building a completely custom theme from scratch, whether you're using full site editing, maybe. Uh, have a sense of what is appropriate and what is going to serve the project and the site for its natural life. Anticipate a bit between what you've been given. Ask for what you need to know. Is the navigation going to work on mobile? What happens if the client adds one more page and breaks the navigation? Can that, can that happen? Um, here's an example where the design that I was given has a fatal flaw to it. Um, I looked at this and I kind of went, how do you get to the middle letters of the alphabet? Like what happens when I click that? How, how am I supposed to sort that? So I had to go back to the designer and say, I don't understand what you need here. Um, what would you like to have happen? And then we had to talk about it and figured out a better way to present things. Um, you may need to extrapolate the basics that the designer has given you to other pages. So do your best to use the elements that you've been given consistently. So keep if, if you have a whole new section of the site, Keep the header looking consistent with everything else. Use the same types of buttons. Use the same types of callouts. Uh, you might need to think a bit beyond the design and enhance the designer's vision as long as you're still respecting their work and their intentions and doing your best to, to, to use what they've given you. Uh, if you have to, of course, go back and ask questions. You might not need to spend six hours going down a JavaScript rabbit hole if the designer is totally fine with an alternative. So 
If you run into some problems, don't brush it under the rug. Have a conversation about it. You say, I'm sorry, I looked into this, but this is going to conflict with that, and uh, I'm going to need this a bit to build this a different way. Here are some other ways that I could do this. Instead of just going back and saying, nope, can't do this, nope, it's too much, too much hassle, like, okay, great, that happens. What can we do? How can we still stay true to this without, um, you know, just spinning your wheels forever on something that might not really need to be done the way you thought you were going to do it? And for design, a developer is a bit of care and feeding of your designer. Um, as a developer, I can say it can be frustrating to be told to move that thing over three pixels, but the designers do see things that we don't. And honestly, that is why I don't really consider myself a designer anymore, because left to my own devices, I won't. I won't necessarily line things up perfectly, and uh, I won't see some of some of the nuances that can really make or break a design. Um, so that is their job, and it can be a little frustrating. But take a deep breath. Uh, again, if something's going to be completely unreasonable, then find a way to have a polite conversation about it. Uh, if you do have to correct the designer's work for technical reasons, do it respectfully. You may be teaching them something that they need to know for their future work. Developers often get a reputation for talking down to designers or being scornful because the designer didn't know something that seems really obvious to them. Remember that it's not their job to know how to do what you can do. That's why you are there. Otherwise, they would be doing your job. So for everybody, what about when things start to get difficult? Listening means letting go of your agenda. It means you don't decide what it is you're going to say until the other person has finished their piece. You're not just waiting for, waiting for a gap in the conversation so you can say your thing. Listening means letting yourself be affected and letting yourself be influenced. Trust comes when you know the other person will hear you. So are you willing to hear them? You can reflect what you heard. Oh, my understanding is, you know, it sounds like it sounds like you'd like to hear your, it sounds like you'd like to see the headers be more consistent from page to page. Am I getting that right? And let them know what they're doing right. Let them know if there's something about the way that they are working with you that you really, really appreciate that uh, maybe the other, uh, someone else hasn't done before. Maybe that's been really helpful to you. I mean, let them know. And a little bit of appreciation can go a really, really long way. So also for everybody, um, the a designer's request may come from the client or the project manager. And they may be as unhappy about having to do something a certain way as you are. It may not be their fault. Uh, a developer refusing to do something may come from hours of research and testing and frustration. And sure, maybe your design doesn't have the thing you wanted exactly the way you wanted, but um, they're they're not. It's not personal. Um, in a conflict, do you have the site's needs at heart? Can you admit it if your approach might not be what's needed here? If you know you're right, can you make it easy for the other person to stand down? Lower the stakes however you can. Find some common ground, a solution that meets everyone's needs, a way of compromising. So investing in the relationship early on is really important. The fruition of the relationship happens the whole way through the process and at the end and in more potential projects if you guys really like working together or have to work together whether you like it or not. In a perfect world, we want not just responsive websites, but responsive designers and developers. So that is pretty much everything. <laughs> um, I have one link that I would like to drop into the uh, chat for you here.
And uh, I'm up for any conversation, questions. This is a little bit about um, nonviolent communication in the workplace. And I don't know if you may or may not have heard of nonviolent communication, but it's a basically a way of approaching often difficult conversations uh, in a way that helps to de-escalate situations and uh, meet everyone's needs, ideally, if you're doing it right, which isn't always easy. All right, um, I'm going to stop sharing and let's open up the floor. Do you have any questions? I don't, I don't believe anything, any questions came in in the chat. You had a few comments. Um, I believe you had an eye on the, the chat while you were presenting as well. Um, yeah, once I put it in the right spot. Where I could see. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so many windows. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a good resource, nonviolent communication. Just give folks a minute if they're typing. <laughs> Maybe there aren't any questions. Maybe, Maybe but everybody was already in perfect harmony. Yeah. I mean, we could just uh, we we could we could just play more dog and cat videos. <laughs> I think with full screen editing, the relationships are merging. Yes. And even really with um, a lot of out of the box themes that uh, um, there's there's a lot of overlap in, in, in where, where I as a developer have been asked to tweak out of the box themes, but the designer is working in the page builder and in the, uh, what whatever the uh, commercial theme is itself designing there and I'm just kind of being brought in to do a little of the harder CSS stuff and uh, play with plugins but I'm not actually really doing coding per se uh, I think designers getting familiar with UX helps to bridge the gap between them and developers yeah and I I do feel that this has happened more over the uh, uh, over the last I'm going to date myself here, but a couple of decades. <laughs> like the biggest problem that I used to have when I started doing this was designers who had only ever done print and had never designed a website. And then they would give me something and that was expected to anchor in very precise points of the page. And it was kind of like your page doesn't work like that anymore. Um, especially when CSS was more limited and you couldn't do something like anchor to the bottom of a page. Now there's almost nothing that you can't do. Um, would you ask the developer to be in the onboarding call with a client to scope out better? You think this is not needed? I think that depends on the developer and the client. Um, it might have more to do with the size of the project. It's not usually needed, I think, unless you're doing so. Yeah, again, it does have to do with the scope of the site. I think if you've got something, if you've got kind of like your basic brochureware site, um, then I don't think you necessarily need a developer on that. If you have something that is more um, kind of a SaaS type of site or uh, something kind of heavy duty functionality where there's going to be more complicated user workflow, then yeah, you might want them on board earlier. Um, some developers will and some won't be comfortable with that either. Um, uh, yeah, a, I think I'm gonna give you an authoritative, it depends to that one. <laughs> Um, how do you deal with a client request that is difficult to execute? Uh, if it is going beyond the scope of what's been promised, um, Kimberly, maybe you can elaborate a bit. Do you mean one that uh, is kind of in the initial um, project scope or something that they're kind of trying to add on after the fact 
or um, something that you should be able to do, but you're just finding it challenging. Yeah, Dario, you're right about that one. <laughs> All right, well, I'll uh, I'll just again try to answer broadly. Um, if you've, I'm going to address mainly the situation where a client comes back with changes that are difficult to execute. Um, first of all, if they are outside the scope of the project, this is where it's super super important to have. Ah, there we go. May or may not be a good fit for their needs, or won't get them the result they're looking for. Yeah. Uh, a great example of that, I had a client once who, you guys are going to love this, they asked for a horizontal navigation at the top of their page, okay, um, but they wanted the menu to be on a ticker so that it moved like a news ticker and scrolled constantly. And I had to diplomatically find a way of explaining why that was possibly one of the worst ideas I'd ever heard without saying so. <laughs> and uh, I actually called on accessibility as uh, a point for that one, where uh, one of one crucial thing that you want for really any user, but you know, especially if you're keeping accessibility in mind, is to have consistent navigation on every page. Um, if somebody is going from page to page, they're going to want to see, expect to see the menu in the same place, otherwise it gets confusing. If somebody has issues with hand motion and the menu is going to be moving away from them constantly, then they're going to get frustrated and they're going to give up on your site and never come back ever again. Yeah, that's a video game. That's right. I That was uh, definitely a lesson in uh, Keeping my face uh, totally, totally calm up. Um, <laughs> so basically, but you you do your best to um, to explain. Like there are going to be good reasons for for why that isn't going to get them the result they're looking for, and and you can tell them uh, uh, plainly without it having to be about them or their idea. Just like, oh, okay, yeah, no, I see why you'd like to do that. That is kind of fun. Um, unfortunately, yeah, that can be a bit of a problem because people don't you know like that. Da, 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 this can be difficult. And you just, you just give reasons. Um, if something is, uh, yeah, change requests equals more money, Sean is saying, um, Absolutely true. You can come back when they want to change later on and say uh, that's a really great idea. Um, we don't have that in scope at the moment, but I'd be we could add that on maybe as a uh, uh, kind of phase two addition. Uh, we can I can scope that out for you, and maybe after launch uh, we can work that in. And of course, if you if they insist on it happening on launch, it's like, okay, that's, uh, that is change control. So, uh, yeah, we'll, I'll get back to you with a price on that. Uh, yes. When they go overboard, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and again, it, you feel it out by the client. There are, there have been some clients that I would, you know, bend over backwards to figure out what they, uh, need on the site because they're so considerate and so appreciative. And then there's other site, uh, other clients where you kind of realize if you give them this one little thing, then the whole, uh, world of dangerous possibilities opens up. Uh, what tool do you recommend for the client to send back feedback, instructions on changes besides the email? Uh, really love Trello. Um, Trello is nice for um, you can you can set up Trello with a couple of a couple of um, uh, columns. So you know one is where they put in any new bugs that they see, and then you can. Uh, move that over into a column and when it's accepted and you're working on it or kind of bounce it back to them if it's something that you're like, oh, actually just try clearing your cache. Um, and so then you can keep track of uh, whatever has been asked for and the conversation for each particular piece. So, and it's it's fairly easy for them to use as well. Um, so that's that's pretty handy. Okay, I think, um, 
Okay, accessibility as PDF. Yeah, 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 that's good. Uh, Margaret saying uh, accessibility argument is reason number one why a web splash page would be better than a PDF, which may or may not open. But what convinced him was I said I couldn't put a functional call to action button on the PDF. Yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, you basically, you're looking at what is it that they're trying to accomplish? Um, why is it that the thing they're asking for isn't going to accomplish that? I mean, if they have, you know, what is their need? If they have their mind fixed on that particular need, then what else is going to meet that need and maybe do it a little better and maybe meet another need at the same time? So bring it back to the needs, the name of the tool. Um, did I mention a tool besides Trello? I think I just, I think I just no, said I don't Trello. think so. <laughs> no. no, I've, I've used some other tools. Um, uh, that I honestly don't like as much. So, <laughs> so I'm only going to tell you that one. <laughs> Have you um, ever received feedback like through Figma or like, you know, using comments on um, on there? Did, or is that a learning curve for a client? Uh, I think our designer does that uh, with uh, the client for some projects. So I'm not so much a part of that process because I'm getting it given to me after all of that has kind of been incorporated. But I certainly have seen some of our Figma designs at F squared where uh, there's lots of little comment markups here and there. And it's I think it's really good for when you actually have that design meeting with the client and you can be marking marking it up together as you go through it. So so everything is fresh. You're not kind of looking through notes later going, did I, what did I do here? Uh, so yeah, that can be pretty useful too. Contents near, I don't know that one, but I'll look it up later. One last question for everybody. Who here is a cat person who's a dog person? Ooh. And you can be something else. You can be a horse person. That's. Hmm. Hard drug person. <laughs> Ooh, goat. Dog and a goat together must be fun. I was wondering if Dev and designers broke out differently. Um, mm. I'm not quite. Uh, oh, into dog versus cat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. We can try that. Everybody put in uh, what your role is and whether you're dog or cat. I mean, I'm here. I'll put one in. <laughs> dog. Yeah, if you're both. Hmm. Yeah. We <laughs> got dev dog, dog <laughs> dev. Dog designer, designer cat. There's more design, some dev dog and cat. Project manager, both. Slightly more cat. <laughs> dev dog, but only cat. Wow. That's so interesting. All right, so it is indeed a mix. Just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's to be expected. We're people are complicated. Yes. <laughs> and yet yeah, I lean more towards the design <laughs> side, and I'm a I'm a cat person, but yeah. I also love dogs. So, um, I I have a great <laughs> appreciation for cats, but. Uh, <laughs> But I, but I, I have puppy nature. I think. All right. Shall uh, we yeah. let everybody go finish their lunch or whatever <laughs> time zone you're in, whatever meal you're closest to, start or finish? <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. No more questions. Mostly, uh, just talking about dogs and cats. Staying on topic. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Kirsten, for your presentation and for to everyone for attending today. Um, again, thanks for your understanding with the Zoom mix-up. Uh, I'm glad that you all made it in. Um, yeah, and if you have anything um, else you'd like to, to ask Kirsten after, after we sign off, um, you can post in the meetup event. Um, and again, if you want to um, attend more online workshops or on the meetup group and also listed at learn.wordpress.org. Um, again, 
Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And uh, we will have a recording of this session posted on WordPress.tv in uh, the next 24 hours or so. so. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Courtney, for putting all this together. Yeah, you're welcome. See you online. <laughs>